Yes, good afternoon, everybody. And it's a great privilege uh, today to have uh, such uh, distinguished uh, personalities with us and His Excellency Ambassador of uh, India, uh, Raj Kumar Srivastava <coughs> in Croatia, and uh, our great scientist, uh, which uh, she is a great uh, expert for the brain <laughs> and all its functions. And I would like to, to make a short introduction to our dear uh, Vida de Marin. She's academy academist, and she's a professor, and she has many titles, MD, PhD, FAN, FAHA, FESO, PEAN, and FWSO. <laughs> and she is a full member of Croatian Academy of Science and Arts and head of its department of medical scientists. And Professor Vida de Marin, uh, M MD, PhD, she is a specialist in neuropsychiatry, graduated from School of Medicine, University of Zagreb in Croatia. And she was head of department of neurology in University Hospital Center in Zagreb. And from 2015, she is a director of International Institute for Brain Health. And also uh, she authored about thousand papers in national and international journals, several chapters in books, organized and participated in num numerous symposia, conferences and congresses. Also, she is a founder and one of the directors of Summer Stroke School, Health Lifestyle and Prevention of Stroke and Other Brain Impairments in Inter-University Center in Dubrovnik and president of Traditional Mind and Brain ENPC in Pula. She is a member of numerous national and international professional uh, societies and she uh, serves various scientific advisory editor editorial and re revival boards. So it's a great privilege that uh, <coughs> Professor Academic Vida de Marin will uh, give us today her knowledge, which she gathered over many years. And uh, she finalized all this knowledge in her new book about the clinical uh, uh, psycho neuro endocrino immunology and uh, the topic of today's lecture is uh, the title of her book and its relation to yoga practice and uh, before dr vida starts i would like to ask his excellency to give us uh, his blessing to open this uh, beautiful meeting Thank you. Thank you, Yogacharya Miklitz. This is a very interesting session that you have organized. And uh, I'm uh, personally thankful to Dr. Vida Demarin for joining this session. Uh, despite her so many hats and so much of experience, she could take time out to, to address us today. It's, uh, we are very thankful for that, uh, especially in the context of yoga. And uh, uh, just we are in the month of uh, what you call International Day of Yoga, which just passed by on 21st of June. This was the seventh edition of the International Day of Yoga. As you know that in 2015, United Nations declared 21st June to be celebrated as International Day of Yoga. And we are very happy that we are in Croatia, where all these seven editions have been celebrated in quite uh, what you call interest from the people in general in Croatia. This year, we had, uh, we had uh, around about 40 locations where this uh, International Day of Yoga was celebrated. And we have close to uh, 2,000 people who participated in different events. Now, most important part of this uh, uh, like interest about yoga is that people are knowledgeable about the real power of yoga and real essence of yoga which is beyond just the physical exercises. And I'm sure that today's session will address that part, that how, immune, uh, how yoga can help in improving the immunity, but connecting it to the scientific principles of like uh, modern medicine, which uh, Dr. Vida Demarin will probably, and I'm very much keen to listen to your experience and how you are connecting these thoughts. Uh, because in this time of pandemic, uh, many of these thoughts have come across that uh, from the physical and mental health and from general happiness and uh, kind of 
avoiding the anxiety connected to the pandemic, there is a very good solution in yoga. If you practice it and know fully well that what you are doing. Uh, and in that sense, uh, I do practice yoga in my own uh, limited way, but I have found many, many positive effects of it in my personal life. And I hope that more knowledge can be sh uh, shared through these sessions, which Yoga Charya Miklitz have been organizing very regularly. And we are thankful to him also, because uh, it is like a universal knowledge set, which is being shared globally now, thanks to the digital revolution. Uh, sitting from our comfort zone, we can actually interact and uh, share this knowledge. And lastly, before I finish, I would also like to invite you, even uh, we have not yet finalized, but in October 2021, that is this year in October, first week, we are going to organize the first international yoga and Ayurveda conference here in Zagreb, uh, physical session, not the virtual session. And uh, we hope that you will get time to address that particular expert uh, meeting of hopefully 100 plus uh, experts on yoga and Ayurveda will be joining here in Zagreb. Thank you very much for joining today. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. And now, dear Dr. Vida, our brains are on your disposal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon, dear participants. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I would like to express my gratitude to His Excellency, Mr. Rajkumar Srivastava, for being a host of this session. And of course, to my dear friend, the other Miklets. We know each other for many years. And I'm really glad that you gave me the opportunity to share the knowledge of these new disciplines, psychoneuroendocrine immunology and its relation to yoga. And I hope that we will uh, all learn a little bit and of, to, to see, I'm a brain expert as Yadra already told you and my, I would say, uh, concentration would be to yoga and uh, brain. So, and brain is very important organ <laughs> for all of us. So I hope that you will uh, really enjoy all together. So let me let me go for the for just a moment. Okay. So uh, this play presents the new concept of the impact of stress on health by emphasizing the closeness of on uh, health psych, brain, and body systems, thus being the basis of a new discipline, and it is called psychoneuroendocrine immunology. It's, well, very long name, but uh, explaining what is going on, the relation between psych, neuro, endocrine, and immunology, and we call it for short PNE. This is this idea of the interconnectedness of organs and organ systems is neither new nor revolutionary. Moreover, it is very experientially achievable. And over the years, it has been necessary to publish the results of hundreds of thousands of scientific studies in order for this idea to be scientifically grounded. And still, we are waiting for its translation into the clinical everyday medicine uh, because it is not yet uh, really present in this practice, everyday practice. So that's why my colleague Sanya Tolan and other colleagues, we, we put all this together in this book in order to make this knowledge more, uh, I would say, present in, in everyday physician's practice. So the aim of PNE is to apply medical knowledge to the treatment of different allergic, immune, autoimmune, rheumatic, endocrine, cardiovascular, neurologic, dental pathologies, and many others. And uh, it is important to, to also point out that epigenetic factors and major stressors from different types of stimuli acting through distinct pathways and neurotransmitters are highly involved in altering this PNE axis, 
resulting in the emergence of the disease. So for uh, all of you that are not completely familiar what's going on in the disease, I would like to point out that uh, some uh, psychological uh, stress, uh, psychosocial stress, leaky gut, T cell dysfunction, then early life stresses, diet, uh, changes in diet and obesity, all these states can uh, introduce and cause chronic inflammation. And this chronic inflammation then is the basis of the diseases like cardiovascular disease, depression, cancer, diabetes, to mention only some of them. So it's not just high cholesterol when someone is having infarction, myocardial infarction. It is the chronic uh, inflammation in the blood vessels supplying the heart and then all this stuff with the metabolic is it's going on. So we have to change a little bit our, our paradigm uh, and to try to concentrate on the whole, uh, whole person, not just an organ or a part of the organ as well. So let us go more than 100 years ago. Uh, Hans Sely, I'm sure that you have heard about him. He is the person who were investigating stress and he was the first one who, who published all his data about stress. He was Hungarian origin. Uh, he was born in Vienna and in 1907. And there he finished his schooling and uh, medical school at University of Vienna. And after that, he moved to Montreal and he passed his whole life there, organizing one institute, a group of people and colleagues. And he devoted his life to investigation of stress. And he passed away in 1982. We, uh, we, we really owe him to, to the majority of these data related to uh, how stress is involved in everyday lives, how is it causing illnesses, and how we can avoid some of them. So if we well, try to, to see how he was considering stress, he said that men should not try to avoid stress any more than he would shun food, love, or exercise. And that it is not stress that kills us, but it is our reaction to it. And also he said that adopting the right attitude, can we, we can convert a negative stress into a positive one. And also a very nice sentence to, to be totally without stress is to be dead. So we don't want to be dead. We want to, to live also with a little bit of stress, but of course we have to learn how to, to cope with it. And his main uh, contribution is so-called general adaptation syndrome uh, that this uh, proposal of, of this uh, how four stages, how we can involve in adapting to stress. So then the body begins to perceive and be aware of something that's going on within him or around him, then the alarm is set on. On. And the organism is uh, preparing the sympathetic nervous system or sympathetic nervous system prepares the body for so-called fight or flight uh, response. So either we shall fight with this stress, being this some uh, problem in our environment, or we have to run away from it. So it's our decision how we will uh, how we will react in this situation. And this fight or flight response is uh, the, the activation of sympathetic nervous system. Then in afterwards, of course, the organism is uh, fighting or, 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 or flighting and it comes to the equation of the body because the body becomes its hostess to this reaction to stress. And it has to uh, recover from that, to, 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 from this exhaustion and trying to return to normal, then the parasympathetic nervous system, this is also autonomic nervous system, uh, uh, working contrary of the sympathetic nervous system, and he is then activated and the body is returning to normal because this vagus and parasympathetic uh, nervous system is activated and then we are coming again the circle is filled in. So 
fight or flight, exhaustion, returning to normal with parasympathetic symptoms, and then it can come again. So this is called general adaptation syndrome. And Hans Seeley is the author of this. And I think this is in the uh, fundamental in all investigation related to stress and to response. So normal psychological stressors and biogenic stressors increase the action of this neuroendocrine hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. I will show you the uh, this uh, this um, image uh, afterwards, and then it's increasing the level of hormones like, like glucocorticoids, and the major one is cortisol. And I'm sure that you have heard about it. It is uh, secreted from adrenal gland, and it is the marker of stress. So cortisol, and cortisol is lowering the proliferation of immune cells, and it is decreasing our immune system response. So everything is connected, and we have to know a little bit about that and how to prevent changes that are occurring. Because we have growing evidence demonstrated intimate relationship between immune system so our, our capability to, to, to uh, fight with, with stress and with problems and the endocrine and nervous system. So this psychoneuroendocrine can influence immune response and of capacity to cope with illness and vice versa. So this is really very important connection and um, we have to know a little bit. And this crosstalk among system is dependent about feedback loops working to maintain this homeostatic equilibrium. So nervous system, uh, psycho problems, endocrine system, immune, everything is connected with behavior is important, environment, homeostasis is then the result if everything is okay. So we have this at the end, PNE, the P is for psychic self, uh, nerve, nervous self, this is central nervous system, autonomic nervous system, PN, endocrine system, E, these are hormones, and immune system, our defense, immuno, immune system, our defense against an invader. So PNEI, remember this is a kind of a new discipline now promoting, emerging in our, um, uh, a comprehensive approach to our patient. Another name should be remembered. This is a neuroscientist from New York, Robert Ader. He was born in 1932 and he passed away in 2011. He is the one that who coined the name psychoneuroimmunology, psychoendocrinoimmunology. He was changing it a little bit. And because he found out that there is a link between what we think, so our state of mind, and our health and our ability to heal ourselves. So that uh, state of mind or emotional state is affecting our immune response and it is, it is responsible to that we keep our body healthy. And he was doing a lot of investigations uh, until 1970. It was thought that, um, that uh, the immune system is not in, in this uh, connection with uh, uh, psych, but then afterwards it was found out and he coined this name, psychoneuroimmunology. At the beginning, he said psychoendocrinoimmunology. So he was doing a lot of research and at that time, uh, well, scientific journals were kind of reluctant to publish these results because it was very new. It was uh, more than 50 years ago. And so he had to organize his own journal and he called it Brain Behavior and Immunity. It was published by uh, Elsevier. And this journal is was developing and it is still going on and it has a huge impact factor and it is now the very uh, nice arena where all these results among others can be published and where we can learn a lot about this new discipline. So just to mention one of his famous research, he was doing uh, investigations in rats, discovering and studied relationship on mind and body in rats. So he provided Sweet, sweetened water and put inside, put it cytoxan. This is a drug that is used like chemotherapeutic in cancer uh, patients and could combine this sweetened water with, uh, with cytoxan. It, when rats uh, 
uh, were drinking this combination, they became ill after drinking this. And uh, then he wanted to see what would be the, their reaction if they will drink only the water without this drug that was causing this uh, uh, illness. And when they are, this drug was removed, so rats were given only sweetened water, but they became ill after drinking only water. So he concluded that all this is psychological. So they were uh, learn to this behavior that they will become ill after drinking and even without these active substances, it was only the water, they became ill. So this was one of the proofs of this uh, important uh, brain uh, influence on our behavior. And this is this axis. So hypothalamus is a part of the brain. A uh, pituitary gland is also a part of the brain and adrenal cortex is a part of is uh, after all, in uh, on the kidneys we have this an adrenal gland so hypothalamic pituitary uh, adrenal axis because from hypothalamus corticotropin releasing hormone is released then it acts to this pituitary gland and the, the, another hormone adrenocorticotropic hormone is released acting to adrenal cortex and then at the end it is uh, in, it is uh, then um, putting out cortisol. So this HPA axis is important axis. We have negative feedback also. So this is, this you should remember as an important uh, problem related to our psychoneuroendocrine immunology. Don't be afraid, <laughs> but <laughs> and don't be uh, well, uh, well, confused. But this is just to to give you an example. So central nervous system with the brain and cerebellum and all this part of the brain, peripheral nervous system. So autonomic, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Parasympathetic nerves uh, are, are going through on, on the vagus nerves. This this is sent the biggest and the longest. Uh, um, more nerve in our system and we, and then all this from hypothalamus pitral this nature we have these stress hormones ink then uh, initiating endocrine system for in males and female different endocrine hormones and then all these are acting to our immune system with cytokines hormones and all this so everything is connected in our organism and not to forget this is important gastrointestinal system is also very important because microbiome with trillions of microbes that we have in our intestines are very important and i will uh, afterwards show you just a little bit about that but this is also a part that should that we should bear in mind and well all this is then organ this chronic stress is uh, causing chronic inflammation and oxidative stress with mitochondrial dysfunction. Mitochondria are the small uh, electrical uh, parts of our, um, uh, in our cells, in our organism, and this oxidative stress and dysfunctioning of mitochondria are then causing many diseases like type 2 diabetes, uh, obesity, stroke, uh, neurodegenerative disorders like uh, Alzheimer's disease, Disease, so Parkinson's disease, aging is also due to this oxidative stress, cardiovascular diseases, insulin resistance, and so on. So mitochondria are also very important, and we should bear this in mind as well. So this is one graph showing that everything is interdependent. Immune system is defending our organism, is clearing it, it's repairing it, developing in order to maintain this tissue homeostasis. Another very important person in Bruce McEwen, he was uh, also devoted to, to investigate uh, this psychoneuroimmunology and especially cortisol. And he found out that hippocampal, this is a part of the brain hippocampus, the structure is changed uh, because these stress hormones are changing even morphology of the brain. And he introduced uh, also this item of stasis and our static load. So just to, this is one, uh, this is a kind of brain picture. This is 
this hypocampus and the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. So we will come back on this part just to, to give you an impression. And this important part changed by stress hormones. And his book is very nice, is The End of Stress as We Know It. So also very nice book that one could read and learn a lot of it. So again, corticotropin releasing factor is going is excreted from hypothalamus to pituitary gland and then ACTH is going to adrenal gland and cortisol is then from adrenal gland is this is this uh, hormone of stress and it is acting to our immune system changing cytokines from anti-inflammatory to pro-inflammatory so this is Chronic stress is causing chronic inflammation. And all this is due to this release of these hormones. And just to, to have this like central nervous system, neurotransmitters to immune system, hormones, every endocrine, everything is connected in our organism. And uh, this allostasis is uh, the name of the Greek or, or origin, Greek root, and uh, Bruce Neck even uh, used this to explained to us that major life uh, stress events and then trauma, abuse, or some environmental stressors like on work, home, or something. Uh, and we have individual differences, of course, due to our genes and experience and also behavioral responses, uh, this flight or fight response, our personal behavior. So everything is connected. And this is physiologic response to this, what is going on in stress. And um, our stasis uh, is adaptation to these changes. And if it is too big, then this is called our static load because our stasis means achieving stability through change. So we are changing our organism, ourselves, everything is changing. Uh, and this cortisol is causing this parasympathetic nervous system, sympathetic inflammatory cytokines, anti-inflammatory, all the dimensions. So this is, uh, these are too many details. I can't go in details, but just to get the impression what is going on. And of course, proposal of the need for an integrative approach, a sense of name must go hand in hand with health education and promotion of healthy lifestyle in order to well attain patient health emotions and stress significantly affect affects health and susceptibility to uh, achieve our health or how to recover from the illness and uh, pne provides knowledge about the biological dynamics of conventional medicine and importance of lifestyle changes for fighting the disease. So again, a, a kind of the drawing. So this is psycho, physiology, stress, brain with parasympathetic and sympathetic uh, nervous system, autonomic nervous system that is out from our control. It's completely autonomous. They act completely different. So just for example, parasympathetic, it's constricts pupils and sympathetic dilates and everything is they, uh, or vice versa. So this is important to know. And these uh, nerve endings are going through vagus nerves. So this is also something that we have to have in our mind when speaking about it. I already mentioned this gut-brain axis. This is bidirectional axis. So microbiome can influence the brain and this brain fog and some changes in mood and behavior. And also brain can influence physiology and what's going on within microbiome. And uh, we also uh, relatively recently, we call this uh, enteric nervous system because from the mucus of the intestine, the, the, there is an uh, in, increase of, of uh, hormones. 90% of serotonin, and this is one important hormone for uh, mood, uh, is uh, released from this uh, intestine, the unum, and also 50% of dopamine, which is important uh, neurotransmitter for uh, in Parkinson's disease and in many other studies. So this we have to have in mind this bidirectional gut brain exit it is very important so nutrition food and everything with this microbiome is in is in interplay and our contemporary colleague is from Italy Francesco Bottaccioli professor he is physiologist uh, philosopher and uh, 
uh, daughter is internal medicine specialist. They have written a lot, several books, very important books and manual. He's also devoted to psycho neuroimmunology contemporary. And this idea is the embodiment of a new physiology to clinical practice. So he's a kind of originator of this new paradigm of healing. And he wrote the following sentence that the root of PNE lies in the study of stress from Haas Sayli to the present day. So it is possible to unite two great traditions, biological and psychological, in the study of stress with the aim of reconstructing the balance of health and disease. So what we need is a new science that will remove this narrow-mindedness of 20th century scientific culture, whose roots is, is, is this reductionism, and to have this so kind new physiology with the uh, a complete uh, uh, picture of the person is in our investigation. So just at the end, stress is influencing our mind and body and emotion and behavior. So you, you know all that from many investigations up to now. I already mentioned epigenetics. We don't have enough time, but just to, we have to say that Bruce Lipton, is uh, the scientist, American scientist, he was a professor at Stanford University, and now he is devoted to, to this epigenetic and uh, trying to show to the person how, uh, how they can change their um, health, uh, how reprogramming uh, their genes by changing what they are thinking they are becoming. So this, is, this was revolutionary, also important investigations published in 1980 or so. And he said that our perception of any given thing at any given moment can influence brain chemistry, which in turn then affects environment where our cells reside and control the fate of ourselves. So uh, we can, let's say, decide shall we be uh, diseased or healthy with organizing what we are thinking, how we are thinking. So very important uh, approach uh, in this uh, cognitive science and uh, his books like Biology of Belief, Spontaneous Evolution and the Honeymoon Effect are recommendable, of course, that you will get more data from them. Then another important person more than 100 years ago, Santiago Ramon y Cajal. He was a Spanish neuroscientist. Uh, and uh, together with Golgi, he got a Nobel Prize for, um, in, for investigation. They were investigating synapses and how neurons are communicating with each other. And at uh, that time, he was through uh, microscope, of, he was uh, investigating the brain. And then he found out that if he was stimulating a part of the brain, another part would then uh, start to change uh, and to make new items. So this was called neuroplasticity, the well, very important uh, mechanism of neuroplasticity. Even before him, uh, um, uh, James was, uh, in 15 years before he introduced it, but he, Santiago Ramon y Cajal is considered, let's say, a father of this uh, neuroplasticity mechanism. But then for 100 years, nothing was going on, only with the decade of the brain at the, at the end of last century, it has become more important. And he said this very famous sentence that every man can, if he so desires, become the sculptor of his own brain. So let us, we, will, we can, of course, investigate it. His investigation, see how we can go on with our brains and the changes in this internal structure of neurons and synapses. This is called this plasticity of the brain. Here we have neurogenesis, new synapses. We don't have time to go in details, but just to get the impression that brain is changeable. It's not fixed and not hardwired. We can, uh, with stimulus, with thoughts, with many other, with chemistry, we can uh, influence our brain and make it more healthy. And another important person is Viktor Frankl, psychiatrist who said that between stimulus and response, there is a space. So in that space is our power to choose our response. 
in our response lies our growth and our freedom. So we can use, shall we fight or flight? Shall we um, believe something or not? Shall we change our uh, behavior or not? So this is very, also very important uh, data that we got from Viktor Frankl. He was, we know that he had this uh, excellent psychiatrist with many books. And well, finalizing with these diagnostics and treatment in uh, uh, psychoneuroendocrinology, we have to have the very detailed questionnaire, physical and psychological examination, laboratory findings with cortisol curve and assessment of allostatic load, and also for therapy, changing the lifestyle, uh, then circadian rhythm should be interchanged and introduced, physical activity is important each day, and mental hygiene. So meditation is also very important uh, to be introduced uh, for these uh, changes. And together with Sanya Todam, uh, we edited this book, Clinical Psychoneuroendocrine Immunology. It's in creation. And we had 30 colleagues who were um, con contributors, each of them in his own important uh, field of investigation. And let us go now to yoga, how it's uh, related to psychoneuroendocrine immunology. This is Sanya Oyan, my dear colleagues, she is sent me this photo. She's with her friends in Lika in her holiday house, and they are practicing uh, yoga and all this very nice uh, physical activity, meditation, and they are behaving really in accordance with circadian rhythm as well. So, well, yoga, you know that uh, better than me, a mind body activity that has components of centering on meditation, on briefing and postures has become increasingly popular in recent years, even in this, in this Western part of the world as well. And its effect on cognition have become a particularly important area of inquiry in recent years. So this uh, is systematic review of current literature done by uh, Nata Goethe and uh, her colleagues and published several years ago. Look, there were a lot, uh, some kind of investigations for many years, but only 20 years ago, around 2000, the number of uh, these publications, scientific publication in uh, PubMed and other scientific basis registries have increased tremendously. So we have now a lot of data with many research related to yoga and this neurophysiological and neurocognitive mechanism underlying the effects of yoga-based practices with bidirectional feedback loops involving autonomic and allostatic regulation. Look how many parts of the brain and centers and spots are activating in yoga, in amygdala, uh, hypo, uh, hippocampus, prefrontal cortex, uh, all the many uh, important uh, uh, centers that I will mention also afterwards. So what's going on in the brain during meditation? Frontal lobe is a part of the brain. This is frontal lobe. Uh, this is most highly evolved part of our brain and it differs us from any other species. It is responsible for reasoning, for planning, for emotions and for self-conscious awareness. And during emotion, this frontal cortex tends to go offline. It is not functioning anymore. We are completely relaxed related to this uh, function of the brain. Parietal lobe is next to it, this yellow stuff. And this is part of the brain processes sensory information about surrounding world, about orientation in time and space. And during meditation, activity in the parietal lobe slows down. Then, the brain during meditation, what's going on in thalamus. This is the gatekeeper for the senses. This organ focuses our attention by funneling some sensory data deeper into the brain and stopping other signals in the attract. So meditation reduces the flow of incoming information to a trickle. And then another important part is reticular formation is the brain's sensory. Uh, this structure receives incoming stimuli and puts the brain on alert, ready to respond. But during meditation, it dials back this arousal, arousal syndrome. So definitely these are uh, 
situation, what's going on during meditation. And also electrical activity. We have several rhythms, you know, alpha, beta, theta, and delta uh, waves are important in acti electrical activity of our brain. And these beta waves are dramatically reduced during meditation as the brain stops processing information that would normally do. But uh, related to uh, meditation, it is it stopped process. So this is before meditation, a lot of beta activities is frontal, parietal, and occipital lobe. And after, look, there is no this beta activity in the brain is more relaxed. It's, it's, it's uh, passive, I would say. Yes. Uh -huh. And also this is, a nice picture in this aspect, uh, um, important uh, neuroimaging method, single photon emission tomography. Before uh, meditation, see that there is a metabolism of the glucose, everything is going on, very busy in our brain. After 10 minutes of meditation, relaxed, cool, as our young colleagues would say, so uh, completely different situation with our brain. And also, uh, there yeah, are a lot uh, of yeah. other important uh, um, changes during meditation. One of very important is this increases grain matter, and grain matter in the brain are neurons, brain cells, and then connections. So grain matter uh, is uh, is uh, increased. And here we see yoga meditation boosts this grain matter, so more activation after after um, practicing yoga and especially after continuous practicing for several years we have thicker part of this brain and also this is one of uh, uh, important uh, data that right orbital frontal cortex is one of the areas of the brain that appears to be enlarged due to meditation not yeah, uh, during dear, but Vida, after Vida, excuse me Yadranko is but we yes. don't see the presentation, the PowerPoint. We can't see on the screen. Can't uh, share screens. But check it. I'm a man. Check it. Just a moment. Why not? I'm sorry, because everything is uh -huh. uh, just uh, a moment. Check it. I share. No, please, no. Just a moment. Go ahead. Always on the. Could it, could it be possible oh, to share some? Share screen. Where is share screen? Dolly, ma zeleno na koi na. Evo share screen, tako je. And share. Evo ga, super. Je. Jo, pa kaj celo, pa onda kak sad, niste sve to vidjeli kaj sam ja govorila? Pa to je grozno. Čekaj sada, onda da vidim di mi je taj. A gdje su sad? Evo ga. Jel sad vidite? Da. Da li je moguće da podelite prezentaciju kasnije u PDF? Da, da, je, je. Puno vam hvala, ako možete na mail. Samo ću sad doći na ovu jogu. Važi, važi. Ja sam mislila da sam ja imala nekih tehničkih problema, niko nije video. Ja kaj niste govorili? Pa ja sam... Evo ga. Ok, let us here we are with yoga now. This is our book. And my colleague Sanja with her friends practicing yoga in Lika. And well... Uh, I just mentioned that uh, 20 years ago, the lot of data we got from investigation in yoga in scientific journals. Here we are, and what's going on during this is frontal lobe and parietal lobe. So it, 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 they are going offline and slows down during meditation. And also thalamus is also reducing the in, influx of meditation and also arousal signals. And beta waves look here is completely relaxed and uh, here we have after meditation relaxing uh, brain completely and also grain matter is boost and here we have okay so this is one of important uh, stuff uh, done also by the same group of author that left hippocampus in 
practitioners, yoga practitioners were more increased than in controls. And in other parts like Caudatus and Talamus, there were a, a small change, but it was not significantly, statistically significant. And this is a, a part of a, a systematic review of in current literature done by these colleagues throw uh, gray matter volume is higher then cortical thickness is present, gray matter density, and magnetomorium is important with years of yoga practice. And also what is important are neurotransmitters. So I already mentioned them. Neurotransmitters are uh, giving uh, well, messages from organs to organs. So it is vital that neurotransmitters are in balance for optimum common cognitive and physiological functionality. And this can be achieved when the brain is in meditative state. So we have serotonin. This is one of these important hormones, neuroadrenaline and dopamine. So they have to be in this circle of uh, uh, homeostasis and allostasis. So to, in, and this is also a possibility that we can uh, achieve a kind of behavior to fight the anxiety. And uh, our brains, as already mentioned, uh, are not fixed hardware, they have, uh, these pathways and circles, and they can be changed by learning or with mental exercise and meditation is really harmless way to encourage the growth of new hormones. This is neurogenesis and also synapses like synaptogenesis. And all these are a part of neuroplasticity that I already mentioned, especially with, with uh, Santiago Ramon y Cajal, who is one of the inventors, I would say, of, of neuroplasticity. So by typing together these neurobiological effects of neurotransmitters, brain waves, and empirical evidence from these psychological experiments, we can uh, find out that meditation is effective treatment for anxiety, and uh, it does not suffer from any side effect, like for example, uh, would medicine do. And it is also very important as potential preventive medicine. It, it can be definitely recommended to everyone and not limited to patients suffering from disease. So also very nice study, what has neuroimaging thought us on the neurobiology of yoga? It is review published a year ago, uh, investigated 30, four international peer-reviewed neuroimaging studies uh, of yoga using magnetic resonance imaging, positron emission tomography, and single photon emission computed tomography. So there were 11 morphological, 26 functional, and three of them were classified as both functional and morphological. And consistent uh, result of, of these findings was that including increased great matter volume in the insula, and hippocampus, then increase activation of prefrontal frontal cortical regions and uh, functional connectivity changes mainly within default mode of network. And here we have these are magnetic resonance images. There are a lot of uh, different uh, important data and analyzing that we, uh, we can find out what's going on within our brain during meditation. And the important person is Sarah Lazar. Uh, she is professor at Harvard Medical School. She was doing a lot of investigation uh, related to neuroplasticity with long-term meditators. And he was, she was investigating them magnet by magnetic resonant imaging, especially demonstrating uh, that amygdala, this is a part a region of, this, uh, of the brain where anxiety and stress are involved and we know that amygdala is this flight or fight part of the brain and this, it is involved in meditating, mediating the stress response. So the, the racing heartbeat, the fast breathing and release of cortisol. So she said that chronic stress is the best predictor of future illness because it floods the body with stress hormones what is deleterious for our health. And this is the basis of investigation in psychoneuroendocrinoimmunology. So the, definitely the same um, point of investigation in both disciplines. Then uh, her amazing brain scans show meditation can actually 
change the size of key regions of our brain, improving our memory, making us more comp compassionate and resilient under stress. And also, his, she said that maybe with meditation and with yoga, we can prevent um, and slow normal aging. So we have meditators and control. So meditators are uh, the, the, this age-related uh, thinning of the cortex is slowed down. And she investigated one group of uh, Buddhist meditators uh, well, 15 years ago and followed them for nine years and compared with uh, demographically matched controls and uh, meditation compared to control had significantly increased cortical thickness in right, middle and superior frontal cortex and the insula. And this age-related thinning was, uh, was delayed. So definitely for nine years, uh, she was uh, followed them up and uh, got these very important results. And also a, another group of uh, colleagues with Fre Frelinger and his colleagues, they found out that in their preliminary study in 2012, that uh, Hatha yoga practice may be associated with the promotion of neuroplastic changes in executive brain system, which may confer therapeutic benefits especially with repeated practice. This is important. As I already told you in neuroplasticity, and we, if we are changing something and repeating this, then there are changes in our brain and of course with epigenetic with our gene also. So I already mentioned Santiago Ramonica House, Spanish neuroscientist. He was introducing this idea of neuroplasticity. So uh, changing the brain. So this is his very nice uh, book, uh, Butterflies of the Soul. He was doing these drawings himself and the beautiful brain. So he was looking through the microscope, then making drawing on what's, uh, what he saw through the microscope. So with attention, we can direct how this neural substrate is built and rebuilt so we can strengthen our brain. And yoga is one of the best a possible physiological uh, situation that can introduce neuroplasticity. So yoga and neuroplasticity are very connected and important in, in this uh, practicing and especially in well, repeating practicing. And we also have a lot of investigation done related to stress reduction. So practice that include yoga asanas appear to be associated with improved regulation of sympathetic nervous system. I mentioned this sympathetic nervous system, it is activating when this uh, alarm is uh, set on for this fight or flight response. And uh, also this hypothalamus pituitary adrenal system in various populations. So we have a lot of uh, studies like yoga, mindfulness-based stress reducing and stress related. It, this meta-analysis was uh, published in Psychoneuroendocrinology Journal, then determining psychoneuroimmunologic markers also in systematic review for persons with TSD. How does yoga reduce stress? Also systematic review of future inquiry, what we can do uh, published by Rilly and colleagues in 2015 and the effects of yoga on stress management in healthy adults. Also, these are just examples, but there are a huge number of these investigations and day by day we are getting more data. So, uh, well, we all know that benefits of meditations are numerous. So we know that it lowers high blood pressure, it improves our immune system, and happiness and well-being is increased. Higher states of consciousness can be achieved, and intuition develops, and of course, so much more you are, you know it better than, than me. And psychological benefits of meditation are, let's say, uh, usually put like that, that it is an increase in creativity, a decrease in anxiety, decrease in depression, decrease in feeling of irritability and moodiness, improved learning abilities and increased memory retention, increased feeling and vitality and rejuvenation, and general sense of happiness and emotional stability is present and increased. And said so again, I, I showed you at the beginning, so this stress is doing a lot of bad things to our body, to mind, behavior, and emotions, and all these can be 
let's say, uh, controlled, and we can do a lot with yoga practice day by day to achieve a better situation related to stress. And also, I would like to mention Professor Richard, uh, Richard Davidson from Wisconsin University. He was doing a lot of investigation also with meditation and solving the problems of stress and negative energy. And uh, he found out that uh, changes associated with greater levels of equanimity and happiness and wealth up uh, present when people are meditating and this prefrontal cortex is activating. And we don't necessarily have to settle our brains when we have, with whom we are born, as I already mentioned, epigenetics and fault that can change and neuroplasticity, all these can change our brain and this is called brain plasticity. So if we feel that we are incapable capable of dealing with stress and uh, that our mood is deteriorating, then yoga and meditation is the way how to climb out of this emotional abyss. And this is also very important data and a lot of uh, uh, results of many investigations are present in scientific li literature and neuroscience and uh, in neurology, psychiatry and this mind and body um, connection. And we also already mentioned some physiological benefits. Meditation is perhaps the best antidote to fight with the stress and it calms the mind while relaxing the body. Therefore, it has been identified as a process to relax, which in turn has immense health benefits, strengthening our immune system and helping to keep the disease at bay. So I'm a neurologist and neuropsychiatrist, and I've advocated this very nice sentence that was released by World Federation of Neurology, that there is no health without brain health. So definitely uh, psychoneuroendocrinology, yoga, meditation, all these uh, techniques and disciplines can help us in achieving our brain health, what is, of course, achieving of our bodily health and of so i would like to thank you for your attention i'm sorry that you were not seeing all this in at the beginning i was not aware that because it is it was functioning with my screen so i i can really share this presentation with people who are interested in by mail thank you once again okay Yes. Stop uh, sharing. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for such a com comprehensive uh, presentation. And uh, you gave a scientific uh, uh, proof with all the scientific language what was the experience of the yogis thousand years back of that connection between consciousness and the body. Yes. And uh, as it is explained in Kaitiriya Upanishad, one very ancient literature, where they explain about different levels of our existence, different koshas, our physical body, and then energy body, and then mental body, and emotional body, all the levels you were connecting on a very practical level and showing us how we can, through change of the state of our consciousness, we can change our brain and change our physiology. And sure. the key keep the body in a healthy condition. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yes. you. Thank I would you. like uh, His Excellency Raj Srivastava to address us. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, what a wonderful presentation. It was uh, as expected. Uh, I was hoping something like this, uh, very enlightening. Uh, you have explained certain things which prompted me to tell few thoughts that came to my mind. Uh, you you remember that Nikola Tesla had said after attending the uh, World Conference of Religion in 1893 in Chicago, he was there and Swami Vivekanand, one of the very famous spiritual guru of India, was there, Swami Vivekanand. He was uh, speaking there. And after listening to Swami Vivekanand, Nikola Tesla in 1893 had said, that he was saying the same thing from a spiritual perspective, which Nikola Tesla was saying from scientific perspective. 
Sure. So today's presentation from you was very much similar to what uh, Yogacharya Miklitz was saying from a yogi's perspective and you were saying from a neuroscientist perspective. Yes, sure. And the, the truth is only one. It's yes, just that's true. <laughs> that's true. So that okay. is very important to highlight that from time to time, the what you call the Eastern civilization and the Western uh, thought process have found the commonality and uh, it's just a question of addressing the same issue from different perspective and finding the same truth. Uh, coming back to your point about the aging that uh, you can control uh, through meditation and through neuroscience, the aging process. I'm also very tempted to tell you that, uh, you know, Dr. Miroslav Radman, uh, mm -hmm. who is in medals in uh, Mediterranean Institute of Life, in Life Sciences in Split. Yes. He, uh, I had uh, twice interaction with him, quite long interactions, and he has said one very interesting thing that he is uh, doing some research for a long time now on the basic idea of that the root cause of diseases is connected to aging. And if through cellular and micromolecular biology, he can find some answers to how to uh, control the aging process, then probably the root cause of uh, diseases can be addressed. So that's also a very deep uh, way of looking at the root cause rather than solving the symptoms, which most of the time our medicine sciences do, that we try to remove the symptoms without actually removing the root cause. And here you were also talking about that how the process of controlling your different waves that are there, theta waves and all, you can actually control the aging process. And that's why yogis, when you look at them, you will find an extraordinary sense of glow on their face, even though they do not use any cosmetics. So that tells you that there is another way to improve the glow of the body and uh, what you call vital energy uh, by using this meditative process and yogic process, knowing fully well that it has been proven through science also. So it's not something mythological, or it's not something totally spiritual, it's scientifically proven. So I think there are many thoughts in your presentation, which uh, prompts us that you should participate with this and probably more detailed presentation during our uh, conference, which we organize in October. And in the meantime, I will also share your presentation with some of the scientists in the natural, what you call the uh, traditional medicine system in India, so that mm -hmm. they can also take some lead and maybe establish some kind of collaborative effort. Thank okay, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and thank you, you for the invitation. Very I'm very, I will very gladly participate in this conference. And Professor but, Radman is an excellent scientist. He is measuring telomeres and longer telomere, the longer the period of, <laughs> of life. Yes, he's excellent. That's true. Okay. And in fact, uh, I must share with you that we are establishing a very interesting cooperation between medals, that is Mediterranean yes. Institute of Life Sciences, and National Brain Research Center in India, in Gurgaon. Oh, so which oh, is great. connected to neurosciences, uh, which you, okay. your field is. Yes. And NB, you know, NDRC is one of the prominent institution in India. Uh, just uh, on the first week of this month, they had a, uh, like this today, uh, we had a virtual conference between medal scientists and NBRC scientists. Mm -hmm. And your presentation might be useful for to sharing with medals and NBRC. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, thank you very much thank once you. again. <laughs> and uh, to all participants, and uh, we were very happy. And uh, dear Vida, you changed plasticity of our brains with your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. And this was my intention. OK, great. Thank you and, for the invitation. I think this is a huge field of uh, possibilities of investigation. So we can set up collaboration in many different ways, I'm sure. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh, do, thank, we have any, do we have any moment for questions or yes? yes. Yes. Uh, okay, uh, I have a question for Dr. Vida, uh, and I'm speaking in English, just uh, English speaking participants. Uh, when we were talking about um, uh, neuroscience and uh, all these elements, how our brain reflects the possibility of diseases or so, 
my question would be how much, if any, real uh, influence or impact of some of the imprints of trauma is transferred from generation to generation. Uh, for example, often it was mentioned that the survivors of Holocaust transfer their collective trauma uh, to the next generation. So do you think this is uh, really only a psychological phenomena or is there some kind of physical genetic uh, imprint and then it transfers through, from genes uh, through generations, from generation to the next generation. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that I don't have enough data related to that, but I think that it's mainly psychological. That it's mm -hmm. not genetical kind of stuff because we are... Yeah, we, I would say I already so. mentioned we can change our genes. So genes can be changed yeah. through these uh, thoughts. So a collective, uh, let's say, um, so it can be just psychological. This is my fault, but I was not in, investigated that uh, with details. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. And I guess <laughs> I'm done for today. I don't want to take any more of your time. No, it's okay, thank you. I just have one short question. Uh, did you, during your work, tackle a little bit the topic of chronic fatigue syndrome? Because this is also something that could be approached from different sides. I'm more, more focused on the nutrition, but also meditation, yoga, uh, breathing techniques, etc., are, I think, uh, helpful. And this is something that is really starting to be very uh, I mean, uh, all around us. Yeah, that's true. And this is multidisciplinary approach should be there because it is, it's one of the, let's say, examples in psychoneuroendocrine immunology that a lot of uh, special specialists from different fields should be engaged in uh, an approach to, to this problem because that's the, this is the idea of this, let's say, new disciplines with all this inside because uh, chronic fatigue syndrome is molesting the person com definitely and ruining the quality of life. But yeah. if then uh, all these important uh, data are taken into account from brain and psych and uh, hormone and all this in um, then afterwards immune reaction, then it can be helped and people would, the person would be. Okay, much it better. would be nice. I will check with the other and if I can get your uh, connection so that we can continue sure. this discussion well, because I'm right. scientifically interested in okay, this. Okay, great. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much for the questions and beautiful answers. And uh, we hope uh, to, to have an uh, opportunity to uh, be in the company of uh, Professor Vida and many times. <laughs> sure. and, uh, because this is really the future of the medicine and the world to refer to the consciousness and to the brain. As you said, the healthy brain means the healthy body and healthy consciousness means healthy brain. Sure. And uh, so this is very important to come back to the source of all the problems. As they mentioned in the Sankhya, in the very ancient literature text that considering all the suffering in the life, the the Dukkha Traya, the, the main three sources from where suffering and the pain and the, and the illness can come to our life, either our psychosomatic or from the environment or from all the possible angles, there is only one solution they found, and this is to get self-realization, to realize mm -hmm. our true self. So this is the main medicine. And sure. you are just... Uh, uh, marching in that direction, showing on a scientific way that this mm -hmm. is the, the, the real um, field of our life, which we can we need to take care of. It is sure. not enough taken care. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I, I just wanted to highlight this point that, you know, WHO has now World Health Organization has established a traditional health uh, section in mm -hmm. WHO since 2015. Mm -hmm. And uh, the culmination of that was recently found on 
21st of June this year, when WHO along with Government of India together have launched M Yoga application, which is mm -hmm. downloadable on the telephone, uh, your smartphone, and you can get the authentic yoga protocols, uh, uh, which has been approved by scientists from WHO. So there is this movement towards taking the traditional knowledge to the main, main uh, frame of the healthcare system. Great. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And <laughs> Thank see you. you again. <laughs> Thank you. See you again. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for the invitation. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Okay. I will send you a on the presentation. Jer ako na početku niste imali, znači te slajdove, niste vidli, niste rekli. Da, da. Ja ću 